This session is on security, and uh, one of the features that emerged with the Arctic Council itself is the concept that it will not deal with military security issues. And so a discussion relating to security is, is moving in directions that have been complicated um, for the past. Um, I'd like to take a, a journey, in a sense, um, thinking about the Arctic in a, in a global context. Um, my, interest, my introduction to the Arctic was really in 2010, uh, when I convened with uh, Russian colleagues the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia. Uh, this was a, a NATO advanced research workshop on environmental security in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it went through the full NATO-Russia Council, so 20 me 27 members of NATO plus Russia approved this specific workshop. And the idea was that security really wasn't being discussed in the Arctic, and that environmental security perhaps was a pathway to begin thinking about security in the Arctic, recognizing that any discussions about the Arctic are incomplete without Russia. And so we began this dialogue, um, convened at the University of Cambridge uh, in, in 2010. We had 17 countries involved at the level of ambassador. We had four ministries from Russia. Our Churchill and Garof, who was mentioned several times, was represented. Uh, and out of that came a series of activities, um, brought me to Russia four times to, in meetings with Vladimir Putin, um, first one in 2010 at the International Arctic Forum. And so from those discussions uh, came sets of perspectives on, on security. And it doesn't really matter whether it's military security or climate security or food security or energy security or cyber security. If you peel back the envelope, all flavors of security really deal with risks of political, economic, and cultural instability. And these risks are both urgent and immediate, and this is the lens at which governments have historically operated. They've operated through a security lens. Uh, it's interesting that we have this meeting in the, in the Reagan building uh, with President Reagan and uh, President Gorbachev meeting in 1986. And in that time frame, President Gorbachev identified in 1987 in Murmansk in a famous speech the notion of burning security issues. In the same speech, he made the suggestion that there should be an Arctic Research Council. And this focus on research uh, has taken hold. Um, there was a, um, an envoy from President Gorbachev went to the State Department at that time frame and asked whether such a council would make sense, building on lessons from Antarctica, where during the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were able to set aside nearly 10% of the Earth for peaceful purposes only, using science as a framework for cooperation. And out of that discussion, we now have an Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council uh, began in 1996 um, and was really at the level of mid-level diplomats between 1996 and 2009. In 2009, the level of discussion moved to the level of foreign ministers, and it was in 2009 that the first mention of the word peace uh, emerged in the Arctic Council declarations. Uh, peace is now included in every subsequent uh, declaration from the Arctic Council. Um, in terms of thinking about the Arctic, um, and just to put things in context, because we do live in a complicated moment, I think, um, it was the 20th century when we had the First World War and the Second World War. These were not regional wars. They weren't continental wars. They were world wars. And the notion of a world war undeniably represents our interconnectedness as a global civilization. It wasn't pockets of people. It was global. It was world. And if we think about it in context, the 20th century is one century. The oldest calendars on Earth are about 6,000 years old. That's about 60 centuries. And if you take one century out of 60, it's like one year out of a lifespan of 60. It's an infancy. And so putting things in perspective, in effect, we're just in our infancy as a globally interconnected civilization, understanding how to manage issues and impacts and resources that cross or extend beyond the boundaries of nations. And the Arctic, like the Antarctic and outer space, have been regions of cooperation independent of other activities around the world. And the reason for that cooperation 
has been science as a tool of diplomacy. So I would like to end, I suppose, on a note of hope and optimism that because the Arctic has science as a, as a tool of diplomacy, as certainly symbolized and, and through the Arctic, the recent agreement on enhancing international Arctic science cooperation, it wasn't beginning, it was enhancing. Uh, the Arctic has the opportunity to continue to mature as a region of, of, of peace and stability. And I would also note that in listening to Vladimir Putin uh, four times, in each of the speech he said the same thing, that the, for Russia, the Arctic is its economic future. And so in the same sense, it would be counterproductive for Russia, as well as all of the Arctic states, to destabilize the Arctic. So I see hope on the horizon for the Arctic continuing to be a zone of peace and cooperation and a symbol of hope for the rest of the world. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, <clears throat> to uh, put uh, uh, my presentation into a little uh, perspective, I would uh, like to uh, uh, talk about a few facts about Iceland with, with relation to the Arctic and search and rescue. And uh, first point is uh, uh, the Iced Iceland uh, is an island just south of the Arctic Circle. It's in the middle of the North and North Atlantic. Uh, despite uh, the name, Navigation uh, is not interrupted by ice uh, most of the time. It's about 50 years since we uh, last had uh, any major problem with uh, ice uh, causing trouble to navigation. Uh, the island in the northern part is about 2,600 kilometers from the North Pole, 4,500 kilometers from here. And it's the 18th largest island in the world. And we have 4,800 kilometer of coastline or 3,000 miles. But our search and rescue region, the uh, region we are internationally responsible for, for search and rescue, is uh, almost uh, 2 million uh, square kilometers. That's uh, almost uh, 20 times the size of the island itself. And uh, our search and rescue region extends uh, quite far into the Arctic. Population of Iceland, 350,000. Uh, no military forces. We have Coast Guard. We have police. Uh, Coast Guard, we are responsible for search and rescue at on sea and for uh, aircraft, and the police uh, for anything on land, and we are supported by uh, volunteers, uh, both uh, search and rescue volunteers that both do uh, operation on land and at sea. The tasks of the Icelandic Coast Guard, uh, there are eight uh, main categories. I'm not going to go into each one of them, but uh, some of them are common with the uh, other uh, Coast Guards uh, around us, but uh, uh, other ones are uh, uh, or not, uh, I would like to mention uh, hydrographic surveying and nautical charting because the Admiral mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, this is what we are trying to do around our island, uh, make uh, the charts uh, 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 more, more uh, uh, or newer and uh, more reliable. <clears throat> but uh, the uh, topic here is uh, search and rescue and that's uh, what we are responsible for. Ambulance and medical evacuation service uh, in the sea around Iceland and we assist also inland as we have the only uh, such helicopters in Iceland, and civil protection. And for example, uh, uh, a big cruise liner on fire or sinking uh, north of Iceland in our search and rescue region is something we would uh, classify as a civil protection case. And the assets we have to do our task is uh, we have three uh, uh, offshore patrol vessel, number of uh, coastal, coastal patrol vessels. We have one maritime surveillance aircraft, uh, we have three long-range search and rescue helicopters, and uh, our staff is uh, between 200 and 250 people. But we are augmented, as I mentioned before, by volunteers which have uh, a number of near-shore uh, rescue boats. But uh, if you think uh, we are a few and we have a few assets, uh, uh, I think uh, we could say we all share the same thing in the, in the Arctic, all the Coast Guards. Uh, <clears throat> Oof, I forgot to... Uh... Okay, <clears throat> we uh, all have um, long coastlines. Just Alaska itself has, uh, I just checked that on Google, has 54,600 kilometers. Remember, Iceland has 4,800, so just in Alaska, the Admiral has, a, has a, a great task, or big task. There are large land masses, uh, for helicopters uh, to fly from uh, one, 
one uh, air station to another. Uh, usually it's over a uh, large uh, area of land. Extensive search and rescue regions. Uh, and of course, as you all know, extreme weather and sea conditions, ice, and there are few assets. Lack of infrastructure, and, uh, but uh, at the same time, we have increased uh, human activity. So, uh, in order to uh, uh, do something about this, uh, we have, uh, among us, formed uh, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. If I recall right, uh, it was uh, the Russians in, uh, in a meeting, the North Atlantic Coast Guard Forum meeting in the uh, UK in 2013, I believe, that initiated the talks, uh, the represent representatives of the uh, uh, Federal Border Guard, and the next few years, uh, the preparations were made by the, the, the Canadian Coast Guard, but uh, the, uh, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum was established under uh, U.S. Coast Guard uh, leadership in October uh, 2015, and the whole time supported by the five other Nordic, or the four, five Nordic countries that uh, are in the Arctic Council. These are Coast Guard and Border Guard organizations. Some are legally responsible for search and rescue, or maritime search and rescue, while others uh, uh, have uh, the duties to execute uh, search and rescue operations. And we are uh, establishing line of communications. It's the bosses that uh, meet and talk. Uh, we support and back up each other. Uh, we share best practices. Uh, we plan to exchange personnel have common training, and the first lab exercise uh, under the uh, Arctic Coast Guard Forum will be held in uh, September this year between uh, the ocean between Iceland and Greenland. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, thank you for being here. I'm, we're going down the row here, and I would like for you to at least to provide some opening comments about sure. your thoughts about safety, security in the Arctic. Well, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks, Mike. And, um, I want to thank everybody for uh, being here. Sorry, I was running a little bit late. I, I first want to begin by thanking the Alaskans. I know there's a bunch of constituents here. I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing, but I see the uh, faint uh, elder statesman look of Mead Treadwell, I believe, in the audience, and Alice Rogoff, and many others. So uh, Christina Wolston, I know, is here somewhere. So great to see, and a um, Marine buddy of mine who's running state ops for uh, Craig Fleener. So, um, Great to see so many Alaskans here. And I actually want to begin, when we're talking about the Coast Guard, I'm, and I'm not just doing it because Admiral Z is up here on the panel with me, but I, I can't say enough about um, you know, the Coast Guard in the, in the United States. And uh, you see it literally every single day. I had the honor to uh, go out to a commissioning of the uh, uh, National Security Cutter Monroe with uh, the Commandant. and. Um, General uh, Secretary Kelly, and uh, it was uh, just a really special event for me. I was in Kodiak two weeks ago, which is uh, America's largest Coast Guard base, and the men and women out there do a great job. And just this morning, uh, Admiral uh, Pekoski was uh, testifying for his confirmation hearing, uh, Coast Guard retired uh, Vice Admiral, who is now going to be, I think, very soon the head of TSA. So, literally, you see the excellence. I, I see it. I think most Americans see the excellence of the Coast Guard, our Coast Guard, everywhere. And uh, in particular, you see it in Alaska. So, Admiral, uh, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of my, my perspective, particularly as a senator who sits on the Armed Services Committee and uh, the Commerce Committee. And the Commerce Committee, uh, I chair the subcommittee that oversees the Coast Guard and uh, fisheries, and then on the Armed Services Committee, uh, we've been talking a lot about the Arctic um, of late. As a matter of fact, during uh, General Mattis's, uh, Secretary Mattis's confirmation hearing, I asked him a number of questions about what was going on in the Arctic, what he thought. This is his quote from the new Secretary of Defense. The Arctic is a key strategic terrain uh, Russia is taking aggressive steps to increase its presence there. I will prioritize the development of an integrated strategy for the Arctic. I believe that our interests in the security of the Arctic would benefit from increasing the focus of the Department of Defense on this region. 
So when you look at the Arctic, when you look at Alaska from a kind of operational perspective, with, particularly with the uh, Department of Defense, you see we exist at kind of what they call in the military the, the seams, operational seams. If you look at the different American combatant commands that are set up around the world, Alaska and the Arctic kind of are in the area where there's a lot going on, but in some ways, because there's so much happening, you don't necessarily have responsibility. Where the NORTHCOM commander is kind of the territory of Alaska and the Arctic. Uh, the PACOM commander, though, Admiral Harris on Hawaii, actually has operational control over the forces in Alaska. The UCOM commander, the NATO commander, uh, has a lot of interest in what's going on, particularly with regard to Russia and other actors in the UCOM AOR. And then we have strategic command um, that are very focused on issues like missile defense in the US, which is all based in Alaska, mostly all based in Alaska and the Arctic. So in many ways, what that does is it leaves it all up to the Coast Guard. And uh, so their presence in Alaska and the Arctic is absolutely essential. Uh, the Admiral and I have had a number of discussions about trying to increase the Coast Guard's presence in Alaska, but to do it in ways that I think um, would have a positive impact on many of the different topics we're <coughs> discussing here. So I'll just end it by saying, you know, one of the things that we tried to do on the Armed Services Committee recently was say, hey, this is a really important area of the world. It's really important for the United States. It does exist, particularly in the military space, at these operational seams. So it's almost as if it's really important, but no one's in charge. So we mandated in the Defense Authorization Act a couple uh, years ago that the Secretary of Defense lay out a integrated strategy for the Arctic. And it, it was uh, issued at the end of the Obama administration, the beginning of the Trump administration, and it focuses on a lot of the issues we're talking about here, Arctic uh, Council collaboration, strengthening alliances and partnerships, um, partnering with other departments, especially the Coast Guard, uh, search and rescue uh, cooperation being enhanced, and um, from the military's perspective, more presence defending American sovereignty uh, looking at the capability of conducting freedom of navigation operations in the region, which I think are going to be increasingly important given what's happening in the Arctic. So I would just end by saying there's a lot of attention, but in many ways I still think we're uh, behind as a nation to recognize that we're an Arctic nation, or actually an Arctic nation because of Alaska. But um, with some of the leaders in the audience here, Alice Rogoff in particular has done a great job of highlighting a lot of this and having the presence and hopefully an increased presence of the fine men and women who are in the Coast Guard, I think is one of the most important things we can be doing to advance uh, U.S. interests in the Arctic. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Admiral, the Senator gave me a perfect segue to ask you a question that sort of came up during the interview. So if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to ask you this question, and that is, uh, it seems like as the Senator pointed out, a lot relies on the Coast Guard's capabilities and uh, ability to respond in the North American Arctic, but also you are part of the Arctic uh, Coast Guard Forum, so you have friends and allies that you work with uh, to deal with search and rescue issues, other issues related to the Arctic. But in terms of the Alaskan Arctic, the North American Arctic, uh, what are those things that you need to be better prepared and to actually execute your mission because you have, as the Senator noted, so much to consider and react to, and hopefully think about ways to prevent. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So if you go back 140 years, uh, there was, it was called Seward's Folly, and the entire territory of Alaska was acquired at the price of two cents an acre. Now, if you can imagine at the height of the Cold War, if Russia had a base in Anchorage, <laughs> So we're at another crossroad, um, and, and we, we do a very poor job of thinking strategically into the future, um, recognizing that the pace of change is much quicker now as we look at whether it's climate change, uh, but just living in a much more connected world. But dating back to 1867, um, the Coast Guard had a presence in Alaska. Uh, and so 
This isn't new to us. Um, what, what is new is that we just have not seen the investment. So when you start looking at what investments do you make in the Arctic, what does infrastructure mean in the Arctic? And so I took a lesson from Shell Oil Company because what they were building were fleets of ships because they were a little bit trepidatious about investing on shore infrastructure, not knowing what's going to happen to permafrost in the next 15, 20 years. When the Coast Guard builds a base, we build it for 100 years, um, if not longer. Um, and so when you look at what does it mean to exert sovereignty in the Arctic, you really need to do it from sea. Um, you really cannot do it from shore unless it's a shore-based aviation squadron. But the next piece is we can't do it alone. Um, and that's where partnerships come in. And so if you look at, you know, what are the strategic tools at play? You have diplomatic, you have information, military, and economy. And, and we heard from, uh, from the senator about the various military approaches to the Arctic. But what can we do in the near term diplomatically? How do we prevent the Arctic from becoming the next nine dash line? Um, where Harry Harris is doing freedom of navigation maneuvers right now to stake a claim. We recognize we've got a Northwest Passage and a Northern Sea Route um, that both Russia and, and, and Canada claim as sovereign. Are there other approaches of, of how do we facilitate commerce, and maybe it's done bilaterally, nation by nation, if they are responsible stewards, if they abide by the polar code? Um, so I think we need to refresh of how do we diplomatically approach the Arctic in terms of what are the near-term challenges in the Arctic. And if you've never been up there, the first one is the environment. Uh, and many people think that it's ice-free. Well, ice-free is relative, and it's all depending on the relative wind. Um, and it may shut in on you on a moment's notice. Um, and so there's a lot of unknown. I think it's not widely known, the, the pace of change that is happening, but certainly if you follow the retreat of sea ice extent, and every year we seem to have a new record being set. I don't get at the causality of this, uh, but we do know sea ice is retreating. As it retreats, that ocean absorbs more heat, and then the next year there's less, less ice in the following year. Huge impact on the indigenous tribes. If we are not engaged with the indigenous residents up in the high latitudes, uh, we're missing the boat, right from the, you know, we cannot do policy if, if we don't listen with both ears. So uh, we have a, an aggressive outreach with the indigenous residents up there because sometimes Washington doesn't always have the best ideas. Um, and so it's important for us to listen there as well. But going forward, uh, this is a region where we, the United States, and it just happens to fall on my shoulders as being the responsible service for the Arctic to make an investment in this domain. Thank you. Paul, I'd like to, again, key off what the Senator said about some governance policy structure issues and get your feedback on the thought of some kind of coordinated uh, Arctic integrated leadership in our federal government. We have different leadership for different departments, different parts of our federal government. Do we need, would it be helpful to have a more integrated approach to Arctic leadership and the different components of the federal government? I'm probably the wrong person to answer about the federal government in the United States, but um, in terms of the Arctic, uh, cooperation, coordination, and consistency among all of the Arctic states is necessary to implement the agreements that have been adopted by the Arctic nations themselves. So we have a search and rescue agreement, we have a pollution preparedness and response agreement, they are effectively hollow agreements in the absence of the infrastructure to implement them. Um, so in, I would suggest that the, the, the definition of infrastructure actually be broadened to include a combination of governance mechanisms plus built mechanisms. So the built would include ports and, and ships, mobile fixed assets would include communication systems, research systems, observing systems, all of which require technical as well as capitalization to implement. But in order to, to be effective, the United States and the other Arctic nations need to be thinking in terms of cooperation, coordination, and consistency among the various measures that they adopt. Before I, thank you. Before I come back to Chief, Senator, maybe like, I'll give you a chance to, to respond to that. How could we move this forward in terms of having Arctic leadership in the different federal agencies? Well, I think one thing that's very positive is um, 
the increasing interest in the Congress on Arctic issues that extends beyond the congressional delegation from Alaska. And it's um, increasingly bipartisan, and um, it's in the House and the Senate, and I've seen it uh, in a whole host of areas, again, kind of related to armed services, both in the House and the Senate, but beyond that. And um, there's a real interest, for example, in the need for icebreakers uh, with regard to the United States. And again, it extends beyond Senator Murkowski, myself, and Congressman Young. So I think having the Congress, and in some ways the Congress has uh, driven this. I think um, the State Department uh, has been interested, certainly during our chairmanship of the Arctic Council. But I think from the perspective of the executive branch agencies, it needs to be much more integrated and much more broadly viewed in terms of infrastructure, telecoms, transportation, military issues. And we haven't done that yet. And um, a lot of the interest is being driven by the Congress, but we're hoping that the um, executive branch agencies can start to recognize how strategically important this region of the world is for America and the opportunities that exist because I think there are enormous opportunities um, in the Arctic and I know a lot of people in the audience do as well. So it's got to be Congress and that's happening. It's going to continue to increase I believe but we really need to kind of make more of a impact from our executive agency uh, perspectives and you know, of course, the Congress can influence that. That's how we got the Secretary of Defense to write an Arctic strategy because the Congress of the United States told him to do it, so he did it. So sometimes that's what you have to do to move these things. Thank you. I wonder, as, as the Chief of Operations in Iceland, I wonder, very simple question, but a very tough answer. What keeps you up at night? What do you worry about? Um, in terms of your uh, capabilities uh, in the north, knowing that there is more transportation, more shipping, more tourism, more demands on all Arctic eight nations. So what, what is it that you worry about uh, from your particular vantage poise, point in, in Iceland, but perhaps from your colleagues uh, in the other Coast Guards as well? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I would say the next phone call from the Operations Center <laughs> saying that uh, in the middle of the night, waking me up, and my my my, my wife was threatening to divorce me, because uh, she's 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 uh, very tired of uh, <laughs> of these phone calls. But uh, anyway, these, uh, these are practical <laughs> answers to practical questions. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> well, anything major, uh, you know, uh, such as uh, uh, airliner going in the water in our uh, in our uh, search and rescue region. Or a uh, fire, or uh, or uh, or a uh, uh, cruise liner uh, hitting a hitting a uh, iceberg, or something like something like that. This is this is going to be a major event for a small organization like ours. It's not only the operation itself. It's going to be all the uh, media attention. It's going to be uh, all the uh, uh, relatives uh, uh, and of people, and and uh, all the nightmare that will follow. This is. Uh, this is what I would say keeps me up at night, but uh, it's uh, very interesting to know that uh, we have uh, uh, our neighbors uh, there to assist us and support if, uh, if needed. Uh, that's uh, very important for us. Thank Perhaps you. I can, a thank you very much. Perhaps I can ask the Admiral the same question and you don't have to start your, your answer with the same opening. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's actually my job to keep others awake at night so that, that I can sleep. Um, but by doing that, um, I challenge them strategically. You know, I mean, to be thinking about beyond the tyranny of the present. Um, and as we think about that, and, and this is, you know, I would say, first of all, whole of Coast Guard, whole of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we recognize we have a huge hole in our capacity within the United States right now, and then how are we going to pay this bill? Uh, and so we've done tremendous outreach with the 114th, now with the 115th Congress, and we've got a down payment to build one-third of a heavy icebreaker. 
um, that, that will take us through 18. I can't talk about the 19 budget because we're still uh, debating that as well and beyond. Um, and so I've, I put markers down with our appropriations committee of, you know, I need steady, reliable, repeatable funding. Um, and so even though I spent years and years as an operator, I'm in marketing and sales now. And, and so what do I do if I'm given a budget that does not allow me um, to sell, have industry sell us a platform? Um, and we need to build six heavy icebreakers. We've done all of the legwork to do that, um, but we haven't come up with the means to deliver that, those, those six. We need to deliver the first one uh, just for the beginning. Uh, the good news is we've got five shipyards right now. We're looking at commercial off-the-shelf designs from Finland, from Canada, and elsewhere, because uh, I need to put the first heavy icebreaker in the water in 2023. So to really answer that question, Mike, is this. Uh, we will send the Polar Star down to Antarctica again this year. Uh, she's nearly 40 years old, and last year she broke nearly 80 miles of ice over 15 th feet thick. Now, if she's be set in that ice, we have nothing in our inventory in the United States, and, and quite honestly, nothing with, among our allies that, that can free that ship, be set in ice. Uh, so that concerns me. Uh, it does keep me awake at night. But that commanding officer gets even less sleep than I do, because he's got to make that hour-by-hour -hour decision. If they have a mechanical casualty, do we call off the mission and we turn around and get ourselves home safely? And I empower our people to do that. But we as a nation cannot sleep on the fact that we are a nation that has two icebreakers in our inventory, one heavy icebreaker in our inventory. And we don't have that network of, of who is going to be that Carpathia that came to the rescue of Titanic. Uh, we do not have that in the United States right now. So that concerns me deeply. And it also concerns me that we don't have a funding way ahead to build out this requirement. Thank you. We have uh, about 15 minutes left. And I think what I'd like to do is, is open it up to uh, some questions. So let, let's take some questions from the audience um, and, and use our time with this uh, distinguished panel in that way. Perhaps uh, we'll start on m my left. Um. I don't know if many of you may recall the Alaska Territorial Guard in that a lot of our young men in our communities are uh, the first responders in the last frontier as the, as the slogan of the PSO program. However, what are the thoughts as your thoughts as our nation creates an Arctic strategy about reinvigorating the Alaska Territorial Guard to ensure that we have first responders uh, present from Alaska to Greenland? Thanks. Well, I'll take I think I'm looking at the senator from Alaska. <laughs> well, Megan, good to see you. Um, I think it's a great idea, and I think that the governor has uh, been focused on it, and uh, Admiral or General Hummel has been focused on it, and we're trying to be supportive on the federal side. We had a provision in the defense authorization bill last year that uh, enabled guards members who uh, travel um, far distances just to get to their training bases to waive uh, to have the secretary of the service that they're they're serving with be able to waive the kind of minimum payment they get for travel. You have a lot of people in Alaska who serve in the Guard and Reserves who actually end up paying the military um, to drill and to serve in the military because it costs so much just to get to the unit. So. Well, I think it's a really important um, initiative. It's certainly going to take some time. Um, you know, the Coast Guard is up in uh, Kotzebue again this summer. They were last year, and they do a great job just recruiting our, you know, young men and women in terms of setting the example and getting people to want to serve. So it's a long-term endeavor, but uh, I think it's a worthy one. And as you know, the tradition of service in the U.S. military, uh, for Alaska Natives, is probably the most, uh, it's a real special kind of patriotism that exists in Alaska because Alaska Natives serve at higher ranks in the U.S. military, higher rates than any other ethnic group in the country, year after year, generation after generation. So I think it's a 
match that we should all be continuing to focus on. So it's a great idea. Yeah, Thank if you. If I can just follow on to that. So we did a mass rescue exercise in Nome last summer. Uh, and we had Arctic Coast Guard Forum members participating or observing to include Russia were there as well. In the scenario, we're going to use 200 role players. This wasn't a tabletop. This was an actual exercise. Um, so we're going to use 200 role players, and they've been exposed. They're hypothermic. We wanted to stress the system. And the mayor of Nome said, we don't need 200. Uh, 20 will more than stress the system. Uh, of the logistics of where is the nearest trauma center, then how do you get them there? How do you stabilize them there? So huge infrastructure challenges. So we're not going to fix that. So how do we prevent that from happening in the first place? How do we look at safe transit through the Bering Strait, uh, through a port and waterways piece of legislation that we're working through IMO on right now so we don't have a collision at sea? I vividly remember, because I was on watch when the Selendang AU broke apart. And that wasn't even, you know, that was through Unimac Pass, um, but on the Great Circle Route. And the challenges that posed, and then the environmental fallout when that ship broke apart, there was really not a whole lot that we can do about that because the tyranny, the tyranny of territory. But the more we can do on the preventive side so we don't have to do the response because the response challenges in, in this region are absolutely enormous. Thank you. To my right. Hi, thank you all for this really engaging panel. Um, my question is in particular to Senator Sullivan. Really appreciate your leadership on this issue and, um, and pointing out the congressional component of this, that Congress is maybe a, a large voice in how we focus on the Arctic. Um, I've had the ability to work in both the federal side and the congressional side, so appreciate both levers. Um, my question is, we've talked a lot about Arctic cooperation and the rules of engagement, and one notable absence of this is the U.S. inability to sign on to the Law of the Sea Treaty. So curious as to whether you think the 115th Congress can actually ratify it this year or in the next couple of years. And um, if not, are you worried about us losing our seat at the table? Well, I, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to happen this year. There's, you know, I, in, for example, I had uh, one big issue I had with regard to the treaty relates to the um, U.N.'s ability to assess uh, kind of fees with regard to American companies on um, mining and other operations like that. What's not unusual, though, if you look at the history of the Senate, is to look at treaties to evaluate them and to send them back, saying, hey, if you change this provision or that provision, um, we'll then ratify it. And um, uh, that's happened, I think, well over 100 times in the history of the Senate. It's a little difficult because other countries then have to change the treaty as well. But so, um, but what we continue to do as a nation is abide by the customary international law that is set forth in the law of the tree, in law of the sea treaty, particularly as it relates to um, freedom of navigation operations and other areas. So, um, I think it's an it's an important issue. I know that our uniformed military officers often advocate for it, and there's a lot we can continue to be doing um, with regard to abiding by the international law that um, uh, underlies the law of the sea, the customary international law components of it. Uh, I think, and I'm, I'm just one senator on this issue, there are elements of it that I have concerns about, and um, you know, if those were addressed, I certainly think it would be a worthwhile exercise to look at trying to move forward. Thank you. I have a, an operational question. It's not an uh, acquisition or a strategy or policy. Uh, my question has to do with envisioning the nearer future as Russia builds up, as we begin to move more presence, either Coast Guard or DOD forces, into the Arctic and also NATO, particularly Norway, does the same. Uh, there's a chance of miscalculation and misunderstanding. What sort of operational measures are in place now or should be in place to uh, prevent the, an escalation of an accident even uh, or a serious situation at sea in the Arctic area? I'll, I'll go ahead and take that Thank question. You. Yeah, so in uh, the East South China Sea, Navy, PLA Navy, they have what's called the uh, the code for on-plan on encounters at sea. 
Um, and so we don't have anything similar to that, but at the same time, you don't have large fleets operating up in the Arctic either. Um, and quite honestly, our Coast Guards operate quite collegially together. And I'll give you an example in the North Pacific. Um, next month, I will send a, uh, a, a frigate uh, to the Western Pacific. It'll have a Chinese ship rider on it. Um, we'll, we'll be working with the Russian Border Service. Uh, we will fly aircraft out of Japan. We'll be working with South Korea. Um, and so if you think of it, you got the United States, you know, just think of this triad between the United States, but then you've got China, Korea, and Japan, who probably won't work bilaterally together, but they'll work with the United States. Um, it's a different paradigm if we look at the Arctic because we, we have some of these are, are NATO members, um, but quite honestly, when we look at what are the near-term threats, and it's a sinking at sea, I think as Agresson alluded to, the near-term threats are probably more humanitarian and not military in nature that really speak to Coast Guard equity. So I don't see a near-term requirement um, because we don't have vessels shouldering one another off uh, should they try to ply the Northern Sea Route or the Northwest Passage um, and, and do that as a freedom of navigation exercise. But I think those straits probably do need to be addressed at some point in time as what is the way ahead as we, we address those two waterways especially from a commercial aspect, maybe less so from a military one. Thank you. Would you please thank the panelists for this, I thought, excellent discussion.